next presenter um, is actually present here at the University of Belgrade School of Electrical Engineering. It's a professor Good afternoon, everybody. of English language. Yeah. So the stage is yours. Uh, I, I will I will share the presentation for you. Just a second. So whilst waiting for the PowerPoint presentation to start, I shall just briefly say that the focus of my research and this uh, presentation for that matter is on free software tools for computational linguistics. So analysis performed in the realm of computational linguistics. Uh, so, uh, and of course, uh, some introductory remarks are in order. Uh, computational linguistics is not something new. Uh, in the past six decades or so, uh, it existed for various forms and it was dubbed uh, in different and diverse ways. Uh, in the meantime, uh, there, there is something which emerged as the, the so-called CL community or computational linguistics community. And of course, uh, consequently, uh, the free software tools for computational linguists emerged as well. Uh, this research and this uh, presentation uh, would be aimed at covering and showing a unitary descriptive account of free software tools for computational linguists, and it is aimed to fill the lacuna in the current scholarship on free software tools in CL. Uh, the focus is, of course, on, the, on these three uh, tools, Prat, Cage, Coda, and NLTK, so Natural Language Toolkit, which is actually couched in the Python programming language realm. Um, so before we proceed, of course, uh, the linguistic part of this research presupposes certain familiarity with the tenets of uh, theoretical underpinnings. However, I shall just briefly sketch out certain, uh, certain theoretical underpinnings in order to smooth over transition to the ensuing exposition. The first theoretical model, of course, which is heavily relied on, is already the classical one. So transformational, generative, or simply generative grammar proposed by Noam Chomsky. So it is Chomsky who, back in 1957, in his syntactic structures, uh, exposed one uh, completely uh, new model of language based on mathematical linguistics and afterwards uh, computational linguistics. Then the second model, which pertains to certain of certain parts of analysis performed and carried out by means of these tools, is definitely relevance theory, whose proponents and whose uh, so conceivers, so to say, are French anthropologist Dan Sperber, Dan Sperber, and the British linguist Deirdre Wilson. Uh, optimality theory is particularly important for Pratt, because even computer scientists, I was fascinated and also, uh, well, I was really fascinated to find out that even computer scientists uh, have these optimality driven frameworks within their studies. Uh, of course, the original authors are Alan Prince and Paul Smolensky. However, the framework I use uh, is a working one proposed by René Caguerre. Uh, then finally, a symmetry theory proposed by Anna Maria Di Schulo, which pertains to compounds or noun sequences. We shall see in the part that follows that we have noun sequences. And finally, the minimalist program proposed by Noam Chomsky. So relevance theoretic framework, which is extremely important for my investigation, uh, is something which is treated as a universal rule. So it operates universally without any exception. And it rests on these two uh, principles. The first, or the cognitive principle of relevance, states that human cognitive processes are aimed at processing the most relevant information available in the most relevant way. Whilst the second, or communicative, principle of relevance 
states that every act of ostensive communication conveys a presumption of its own optimal relevance. Of course, this was later on expanded uh, by this principe de pertinence. So Dans Perber, who said, tout acte de communication ostensible communique la présomption de sa propre pertinence optimale. So every act of ostensive or demonstrative communication uh, relies on assumption or presumption of its proper uh, optimal relevance. It is a cognitive inferential account of human communication, and these two references are uh, the most widely used by relevance theorists. Uh, then uh, the thing which I utilize is actually an eclectic model in which I fused two opposing uh, ends. On the one hand, we might go radically semantic by means of the natural semantic meta language. Uh, unfortunately, and I do apologize for not including her name, uh, the author of this uh, model is Anna Vyazhbitska. And on the other hand, we might go radically pragmatic, uh, which is couched in terms of relevance theory. So on the uh, strictly speaking and roughly speaking at the same time, uh, on the one hand, we've got semantics, which can be seen as a sort of decoding in some computational terms versus pragmatics, which can be accounted for by psychological inference. Uh, so uh, relevance can be also defined as a two pronged property. It is a sort of cognitive trade-off, which actually makes a distinction between concepts and procedures. So on the one hand, we've got conceptual encodings, concepts or words, like for example, a car, so which has its encyclopedic, I beg your pardon, entry. And then it has its dictionary entry, it has its phonological form, syntactic form, whereas procedural items do not have meanings, roughly speaking. So these are discourse connectives, discourse markers, some small words which are pretty redundant from some points of view. And then optimality theoretic framework for which we haven't got time actually to simply go and elaborate on uh, extremely deeply. We have these, these two opposing constraints. On the one hand, we've got markedness which exerts the rule that uh, the universal uh, form should be unmarked, whereas on the opposing end, we've got faithfulness, uh, which actually proposes that lexical contrasts should be put forward. Now, something about corpora, because we linguists, we deal with corpora. Uh, so, so historically speaking, the first corpus was perhaps dedicated to sacred texts, and afterwards we had the Old Testament, and then the New Testament, the Talmud, uh, so very sacred texts. And then in the Middle Ages, we had some novels which represented a form of corpora. Uh, but in any case, the basic question which might be posed is how much is enough? And the second feature which pertains to corpora is the feature mentioned by one of the presenters during this day. Actually, he, was, uh, he, he responded to a question posed by somebody from the audience. And he said that representativeness is pretty difficult to pin down both in computational and purely linguistic terms. Historically speaking, we have these corpora, like the Brown Corpus of Standard American English, with one million of words, defined as the first modern electronically readable corpus, then the famous Lancaster Oslobergen Corpus, the British National Corpus, and the last one, my favorite, the Santa Barbara Corpus of Spoken American English, uh, which I dubbed SBCSAE, uh, containing 249,000 words. But the striking thing is that this corpus actually relies on the spoken language, as opposed to some previous corpora. Unfortunately, corpora are not open source. Uh, you should almost always pay for these corpora. For example, one just to illustrate one CD containing 
the corpus cost 2,000 euros some six or seven years ago. Uh, unfortunately, again, I've missed to insert the Gutenberg project. Uh, so with the advent of Gutenberg project back in 2003, at least I started using, uh, using that in 2003. Uh, well, strictly speaking, it is not a corpus, but since a corpus can be defined linguistically as a body of texts, so a collection of texts, which is collected according to some criteria. So it can be a face-to-face -face interaction, telephone conversation, academic lectures, and so on and so forth. So this, uh, uh, that is one important feature of corpora. As regards Prat, I shan't go into details whilst exposing uh, this uh, free software tool because the written version of my paper already contains perhaps tedious uh, description and technical specifications of the very software tool. However, I shall immediately go on the problem which uh, brought my attention uh, to, to this uh, software tool. And uh, it is focused on compounds or complex nominals or noun sequences or complex constructs. So since Pratt is, an, uh, is a free tool for acoustic measurements, I focused on the pronunciation of compounds. So compounds, binary compounds, multi-constituent compounds, and starting from Noam Chomsky and Maurice Halle back in 1968, there were two types of stress, nuclear stress and compound stress. So according to linguists, uh, compounds have the stress on the first element, whereas noun phrases have the stress on the second element, of course, if the uh, two constituent contra uh, uh, compound, I beg your pardon, is in question. So this is the notorious blackbird uh, pattern, stress pattern, so on the one hand, we've got blackbird. So if pronounced with the stress on the first part, it is a type of bird, which is translated into Serbian as horse. Whereas if you say blackbird, so the accent or the stress is on the second part, uh, it is any bird which is black as opposed to red bird, uh, I don't know, green bird and violet bird for that matter. Uh, then we've got another notorious example, provided by Leonard Bloomfield back in 1933, ice cream, ice cream or ice cream, ginger ale and chicken salad by uh, Mark Aronoff and Kirsten Pudeman. So uh, whilst investigating compounds, I've noticed certain uh, variations. The first variation which was spotted pertains to dialect, so dialectal variation. On the one hand, we've got American English, uh, and on the other, we've got British English. So Boy Scout versus Boy Scout, uh, ice cream versus ice cream. Then we've got variation in similar structure cases, apple cake, but apple pie, lemon cake versus lemon pie. And this last one phenomenon was labeled as the so-called fami family constituent bias by Ingo Plug and his associates. Since general English is not in the focus of my research, I simply had at hand something which is used both in the teaching process and also for investigative purposes, and that is the discourse of electrical engineering and computer science, very broadly speaking. So I've uh, analyzed multi-constituent constructs constructs which contain uh, a ranging number of items. It can range from two, three, up to six. And we've got, uh, we, we see actually on this slide, uh, one uh, striking property of multi-constituent compounds and it is called recursiveness or recursivity according to some other linguists. So we've got an item bridge which can be expanded into diet bridge then diet bridge rectifier, then three-phase diet bridge rectifier, then low harmonic, three-phase, and so on. So uh, finally and ultimately, we've got a multi-constituent construct which contains lots of these items. 
uh, whilst analyzing academic lectures, I opted for academic lectures. Why? Because I wanted to avoid uh, native speakers' intuition. Uh, generative grammarians usually operate by involving a native speaker intuition, so their own intuition, or check something against the intuition of a native speaker. Since I'm not a native speaker of the English language, I had to uh, recourse to something which can be, uh, which can acoustically and precisely measure the phenomena I spotted. So, uh, first of all, I've spotted by means of my own subjective perception these variations in the corpus, and then I subjected these uh, items, which were previously excerpted from the corpus, to the Prat in order to analyze them. And we have now uh, an example of the random number generator, which is a case of uh, an intra-speaker variation. So one and the same speaker, an, an academic lecture uh, held at the MIT Computer Science Department dedicated to uh, the introduction of algorithms. So one and the same native speaker whilst delivering his lecture, uh, actually pronounced random number generator, and then uh, twice two tokens were extracted with random number generator. So with the stress on the last uh, last part or the last item or the last constituent for that matter. Uh, so I won't bother you with details. So these are just uh, screenshots of uh, these tokens, which I measured and in, in included in the written version of the paper. And I've tried to answer uh, these questions and probably discourse semantics might be at stake. One tentative conclusion would be that whenever we have a multi-constituent construct in conclusive statement with some sort of generic meaning, it has the stress on the last syllable or on the last constituent or on the last part of that particular compound. Another thing which I unfortunately haven't included on this slide is that within one specific discourse community, members of that particular community stress uh, these compounds in their respective way. Uh, how come? So, uh, for example, a discourse community of engineers, so they are extremely familiar, well familiar, with many of these concepts, for example, diode bridges, rectifiers, or random number generators, or Monte Carlo algorithms and things like that. So they do not treat that as uh, a compound, but as a sequence, as a phrase. Whereas people who are laymen, uh, who are non-experts for that particular uh, discourse, so to speak, they simply tend to play by the rules and to actually implement the official algorithm of uh, the contemporary English grammar. Uh, then the second tool at hand is a KH coder, which is defined uh, very tentatively as a free software tool for quantitative content analysis or text mining. And at the same time, it is utilized for computational linguistics. It involves lots of different possibilities uh, like multidimensional scaling, cluster analysis, co-occurrence network. And I actually implemented this uh, tool to my corpus of digital museums. So six digital museums were analyzed, actually the, the discourse of digital museums of digital art, actually. Uh, and these are the results, uh, visualizations, different analy analyses of clusters, and so on and so forth. And we've got this, uh, automatically generated table, which uh, tags parts of speech, which are uh, extremely important for linguists. So we've got proper noun. Uh, like, uh, for example, th th this was a problem. Uh, if you pay attention to new, it is treated by as a proper noun because it is uh, written with the capital letter. So this might be one potential challenge whilst using this 
uh, free software tool. So it does not make uh, fine tuning, fine distinctions uh, between uh, now proper nouns and common nouns. I apologize for interruption, but we ran out of time. If you need a couple of more minutes to finish your presentation. All right, I'm I will wait. speed up. I'm sorry because I've got uh, so potential okay. challenges, orthography. So lots of different ways of writing one and the same item, British as opposed to American, phone box, phone box, all items meaning telephone, call box or telephone booth, user friendly, written as a hyphenated word as opposed to user friendly, which is written with a, a space with a blank uh, in between. Uh, all right, I have to skip this. Uh, all right, and now the third, uh, free software tool. It is NLTK, the Natural Language Toolkit, which actually represents a collection of libraries and programs for symbolic and statical NLP written in the Python programming language in order to execute the computational text analysis or CTA. Uh, so uh, my, this is just my screen capture of some illustrative examples of the NLTK corpus structure. So if you want to import, you simply type down import NLTK from nltk.book, import asterisk, and then you are provided with these beautiful corpora, which are actually for linguists, it is a real treasure. So all these corpora, which are free of charge. And then uh, if you want to further delve into some deeper analyses, you are uh, offered uh, concordance analysis. This is uh, an example of a concordance. So you simply select an item you want to see, uh, you want to see in the context of its left and right context, and then you, you get this automatically generated list. Then another thing which is extremely useful for linguists is counting within an LTK corpora. So it is pretty simple though not simplistic you simply type down len open brackets text and you uh, put the number of the text you, you've previously selected for example number two close brackets and enter and then you obtain uh, the number the exact number uh, another thing uh, these plots uh, lexical dis dispersion plots uh, all right so if we try to compare, have I got just a minute to conclude? Yes. So if we want to tentatively compare these three tools, we might say that one common denominator for all of them might be a pretty good visualization given the fact that they are free of charge. So I suppose that computer scientists or developers are not so motivated as those who are paid for, for executing uh, their uh, tasks then extreme user friendliness. However, there are some limitations, uh, the majority of which are actually expounded in the written version of this presentation in the paper itself. Uh, and uh, the, the thing which matters is again, your point of departure. So it depends whether you are a linguist, a contrastive linguist, a computational linguist, or computer scientist for that matter, or, or electrical engineer, for whom it is very easy to perform uh, many of these tasks. And of course, uh, last but not least important, the ready-made language data provided, uh, like I said, uh, during this exposition. Uh, so we had lots of these corpora, which are free of charge. The user actually uh, refers to the nature of the user. And uh, this investigation, unpretentious investigation, uh, actually provided a sort of re-examination of these free software tools in CL from a comparative perspective, uh, whilst utilizing already available corpora and aiming at broadening uh, these lovely and appealing dimensions of computational texts analysis. Uh, since I come from the realm of humanities, I really do have to uh, re read these acknowledgements. So I should like to express my gratitude to Professor Dr. Nadit Samikus from the Faculty of Electrical Engineering, University of Belgrade, who made me experience the excitement of going beyond the secure limits of philology and linguistics and for making my 
computational linguistic analysis pipe dreams come true. Professor Nadica Milkovic offered more than valuable suggestions and ideas. I owe a debt of gratitude to Professor Dr. Predrag Pirich from the Faculty of Electrical Engineering, University of Belgrade, for his patience of a saint and academic generosity whilst sharing his immense expertise, wisdom, and academic kindness. My gratitude goes to Professor Pirich for providing me with inspiration and offering his most constructive scrutiny. And last but not least, important, my Python motivated tasks have been eased by Ms. Sanya Delce, teaching assistant from the Department of Computer Science and Information Theory, and who patiently answered a number of my questions and revealed the charm uh, of the Pi script uh, for the Python programming language. Thank you for listening and thank you for your time. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Professor Juric, uh, for this great presentation. I think we can skip questions for now, yeah. but if you stay here till, until the end of the session, um, I, we, we can chat about this. We will slow down this last part of your presentation. And I, I, I've heard for the first time that I made someone's dreams come true, so thank you. And you maybe rethink my shop uh, <laughs> now from the beginning of the conference. I um, ja bih zamolila profesora Đurića. Um, ako želite, imamo jedno pitanje za vas. Ako hoćete da, 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 možemo, da mogu da nas čuju svi koji su online, ja ću uključiti kameru. Ok. Ok, me again. No, I, I can't see myself, but doesn't matter any cap. Ok, that's good. Uh, that's great. Uh, just one question. You mentioned Noam Chomsky. Long time ago, he started computational linguistics. What was computational linguistics at that time regarding the level of development of computers at that time? Well, computational linguistics itself, so to say. Yeah, yeah. well, when it all started. Um, well, it started it? in a simple way because Noam Avram Chomsky actually implied uh, the, the postulates of mathematical and computational linguistics to his theories, and then programmers accept, readily accepted his ideas and implemented those algorithms, so to say, uh, onto language material at hand. Uh, and there was one, well, I should call it a, a cold era period in linguistics okay. when there was a discrepancy uh, between uh, the development of programming and the need to be a higher level programmer in order to uh, to follow all the steps in order to be able to to deal with serious analyses i, I should very uh, well not strictly but very broadly put that line somewhere in 1986 or something like that after basic i'm talking about programming in basic uh, and then afterwards with the advent of more sophisticated ways unfortunately uh, programming languages were not uh, readily, uh, uh, well, they were not welcomed by all linguists. Uh, the, the same story like with psychologists. I think that lots of linguists are technophobes. No? Okay. Uh, okay, so it started as theoretical computational linguistics and then became experimental uh, computational yes, so linguistics. Myself or Chomsky? I wouldn't um, compare myself with Chomsky. Yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> Let's start with Chomsky with theoretical and regarding <laughs> experimental part. Was it hard for you to switch to programming? Do you believe that you're going to become a well, hacker? Well, um, historically speaking, I, I would have to, to tell a whole story because I had parting and departing with programming. Uh, I myself am not, I'm not a, a computer scientist, uh, nor a programmer for that matter. But I had contacts, like I said, with BASIC back in 1986, which was not serious programming at the time. I was, let's say, uh, five years old. So, uh, no, not five years old, I'm sorry. Uh, so I was, uh, that was my first contact with BASIC. And then afterwards there was a huge pause and then Pascal arrived and we were all trained in Pascal. And that was it, that was over for programming. And then afterwards, 
uh, whilst uh, seeing the need to incorporate programming skills into serious computational analyses, uh, I had to again uh, take programming into my hands, so to say. Yeah, okay. And uh, could you tell us something about the basic set of programming tools needed by a linguist? And the same question for a computational linguist. Well, comp I can say that computational linguists predominantly use, for example, the statistical package R. They, uh, they use Python. Python is extremely popular starting from 2006, 2007, let's say particularly in the domain of morphology. Uh, there are lots of papers dealing with, uh, for example, the Macedonian language uh, and their morphology, Croatian uh, as well. So uh, there is no, I, I use the term tool extremely broadly, even for these libraries, uh, which are readily implementable for any linguistic research. So. Uh, I think that a linguist should be equipped with knowledge of the Python programming language, even though it is an interpretive language. I think that it is uh, very, very uh, user-friendly for linguistic research and linguistic analyses. And of course, some other languages are also welcome, like C, C++, C Sharp and things like that. But I think that uh, an average linguist uh, cannot simply be well-trained in all these uh, languages and all these aspects of computational linguistics. So they, they should have some starter pack and this starter pack uh, should include the, the tools which I described at least for phonological analyses, for morphological analyses, for syntactic analyses, and discourse analysis as such and text linguistics. So that would be some sort of, of a starter pack. So okay. Prat, Cage, Coda, which is both open source and free of charge and NLTK. Uh, there is also a uh, blot, for example, which is text blob, I'm sorry, I beg your pardon uh, for this lapsus lingua. So a text blob, which also uses Python libraries and which is also extremely user-friendly for uh, any linguistic research so okay so. and just one more question i promise this is the last one uh regarding tech giants like google do you believe they would be able to assemble easily a nice corpus of language of language well there are many corpora which are uh, free of charge so to say wikipedia can be treated as as one corpus, but uh, we go back to that question of representativeness because a corpus by definition should be a body of texts which are selected according to some criteria. So for example, a body of religious texts, a body of, I don't know, uh, texts or textbooks dealing with uh, digital electronics. So one, subset of, of genres and texts. And Google as such is a broad uh, phenomenon. It, it encompasses uh, different genres, different discourses. So I, I can't believe that, I, and I seriously doubt, as a matter of fact, that Google itself can be uh, a corpus. So uh, yeah, okay, I, I meant their access to data uh, is uh, such, uh, such immense. We yesterday. still pay for these corpora. Yeah, so the pay. corpora okay. which I mentioned, Lock Corpus, Longman Corpus, Brown Corpus, Boston Radio Speech Corpus, you have to pay in order to, uh, to manipulate the language data. And just came to my mind, uh, could you study using computational linguistics evolution of a language? Languages Evolve. I believe yes. that you agree with Well, that. I think that th there might be an algorithm which can be implemented to the history of language and the evolution of language and diachronic part of language studies, actually, from the very beginnings, from the Sanskrit to, I don't know, to modern languages such as English, French, Serbian, and so on and so forth. But I think that it should and uh, ought to include 
that the whole team of scientists, yep. interdisciplinary scientists, it cannot be performed by solely by just one linguist or just by one computer scientist or a developer interested in that particular area of study. So, uh, as a matter of fact, my exper experimental experience in that area is that we have a book uh, from electrical measurements from 1932 or something like that. Reading that book nowadays is like reading ancient history language. That, that's, that's completely different. You know, phrases are different, uh, equipment is different, everything is different. So I said, oh, such a short time and such a great evolution in language. Okay, yes. thank you very much. All right, thank you.